well regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state. The right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Thanks so much for tuning in to another edition of Bearing Arms, Cam and Company. My name is Cam Edwards. It is great to have you with us here today. A little bit of a uh, change from what I had planned on doing. Um, Hoping to talk with uh, Sheriff Scott Jenkins uh, uh, in Virginia, but unfortunately the uh, sheriff is actually doing some work, so he uh, couldn't join me on the program today. But uh, I'm hoping that we'll be able to have Sheriff Jenkins on the program here uh, tomorrow on Bearing Arms Cam and Company. Uh, he was there at the hearing in the Senate Judiciary Committee yesterday when uh, four Senate Democrats joined with every Republican on the committee to vote down House Bill 961, Governor Ralph Northam's gun ban, magazine ban, suppressor ban, trigger activator ban. Uh, and I would love to uh, talk with Sheriff Jenkins about uh, what happened uh, yesterday. And then, uh, again, what's going to happen going forward? Uh, Sheriff Jenkins made national news when he talked about uh, basically uh, deputizing uh, every county resident uh, in order to avoid uh, or bypass any sort of gun ban that would have been coming down the road because uh, that ban would not have applied to law enforcement. So Sheriff Jenkins said, well, deputize everybody. And there, they're they're law enforcement. Now they're exempt. Uh, What does he think about things like red flag laws, uh, uh, the uh, gun rationing uh, bills that we've seen here, bills that would criminalize parents who allow uh, their minor children uh, access to firearms for hunting or or even for self-defense? Hopefully, again, we'll get a chance to talk with the sheriff about that on tomorrow's program. But we do have some other news to get to, including some 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 fallout uh in virginia over that vote uh on house bill 91 in the senate judiciary committee i mentioned that there were four democrats who voted against that measure um we had heard three of them uh, were opposed to the original language of house bill 961 uh three of these committee members uh, senator john edwards who's the chair of the senate judiciary committee uh uh then there was uh, senator craig deeds uh, Senator Suraville, Steve Suraville, uh, was he voted against the measure, and nobody really expected him to do that. Uh, but for whatever reason, Chap Peterson, state Senate Democrat uh, from Northern Virginia, is the one that is getting the lion's share of grief from members of his own party uh, in the legislature. I want you to check out a couple of tweets. This from uh, Amy Friedenberger, who's a reporter for the Roanoke, uh, Virginia newspaper. And this was from a hearing that she was covering Tuesday morning uh, in Richmond. She said a House panel dealing with guns killed a bill from Senator Chap Peterson uh, that would have allowed part-time law enforcement to purchase their service firearms at retirement. Only full-time law enforcement officers can do so. Now, this passed out of the Senate 40 to nothing. So it was unanimously approved by the state Senate. And then uh, it was killed in a House committee today. Amy uh, uh, Friedberger Friedberger says people in the room, including gun control advocates who liked the bill, believe Democrats killed it because Peterson voted against the assault weapons bill yesterday. So in other words, this was the the House Democrats' revenge uh, against Chad Peterson. Oh, uh, you voted against our gun ban bill? Well, we're going to kill this bill that received unanimous support from the Virginia State Senate. Now, here, here's the thing. Who's really hurt by this vote? Is it Chap Peterson? Not really. I, I don't think he's a part-time law enforcement officer. The people who are honestly going to be impacted by this are those part-time law enforcement officers who will not be able to purchase their service firearm when they retire. And Virginia House Democrats apparently don't give a damn about those individuals because I don't think this is about public safety at all. In fact, I think they've proven it time and time again this session. This is not about public safety. This is about their petty personal politics. That's what this is about. And when uh, Chap Peterson uh, dared to vote against this gun ban bill because he didn't think it was a good idea. In fact, he told Fox and Friends earlier today he was surprised that it got out of the House and made it over to the Senate side. Uh, His Democratic colleagues now want to enact their revenge. Frankly, I got to say, pass the popcorn. As a Virginia resident, we've got less than a month to go uh, in this legislative session. March the 7th is the uh, final day of the Virginia legislative session. And the more infighting and the more bickering and the more vitriol there is between Democrats in the House and Senate, the better off I I think it's going to be for gun owners. Because we've got a lot of bills, as we heard from Dave Adams yesterday, a lot of bills 
that are going to end up in a conference committee. The Senate version is going to differ from the House version. And then these Democrats uh, in the House and Senate are, are supposed to get together and try to hammer out their differences. So I want this to be, I, again, personally, I want this to be as ugly a fight as possible. I want there to be as much acrimony as possible because I don't want them to work well together to infringe on our right to keep and bear arms. I hope that when the House Democrats and the Senate Democrats sit down at a table across from one another, that they can come to any sort of agreement. I, that's what I'd love to see. I, now, I suspect that we're probably not going to be that lucky, but uh, it is kind of fascinating to see the, uh, the infighting begin uh, in the wake of the demise of House Bill 961. For the session, by the way, this, is, this comes back next year. Uh, all, all Peterson did was uh, a, a vote to send this bill, and I think Craig Eves is actually the one that offered up the amendment, uh, to send this legislation to the Virginia Crime Commission to be studied. So they didn't actually vote to kill the bill. They just voted to push it off to the Virginia Crime Commission, and it'll come back next year. But I can't imagine that with this move, House Democrats uh, earned the support of Chad Peterson in 2021 for this gun ban bill. Now, in other news outside of the state of Virginia, we've got a Democrat debate coming up on Wednesday. I, and I confess, I've skipped the last few uh, Democrat debates. I've not watched them on TV. I've kind of covered them uh, after the fact. Um, but I'll be watching tomorrow night because for the first time, Michael Bloomberg is going to be on that debate stage, uh, thanks to a, a, a new poll that came out uh, just under the deadline for Wednesday's debate. Uh, it was a Marist poll uh, showing him at 19%. I know. Uh, and uh, that qualifies him to take part in uh, tomorrow night's debate in Las Vegas, even though uh, Michael Bloomberg is not actually on the ballot uh, in the Nevada caucus, which will take place on Saturday. And by the way, that uh, is shaping up to be a uh, real <laughs> show as well. Uh, they've got all kinds of problems with the uh, the app that they were going to use, which was des designed by the same company that uh, did the app in the uh, Iowa Democratic Caucus. So they pulled that back. They said, all right, now we're going to use this thing uh, instead, but nobody's been trained on how to do it. I mean, this could be a gigantic cluster uh, coming up on Saturday. And Bloomberg's not going to be a part of that. He, I believe, is not on the ballot in South Carolina. It's really the, the Super Tuesday states that he's uh, uh, focusing on. But he'll be on the debate stage for the first time. And I want you to take a look at the rise in Bloomberg in polling recently. This is from Real Clear Politics, the uh, 2020 Democratic presidential nomination. You can see there, these are the last uh, five polls. Bloomberg, in the last five polls, 15%, 11%, 16%, 12%, 19%. .19%. He is now solidly in third place in the Real Clear Politics polling average behind Bernie Sanders at almost 25%, Biden at uh, almost 18%, and there's uh, uh, Michael Bloomberg at 14.5% in the uh, Real Clear Politics average. Now, if you look at the graph over time, uh, you can see this surge really beginning uh, even before Biden started tanking. So uh, I know this gets a little confusing here, but that uh, uh, green line at the top, that's Joe Biden. Uh, and you can see him tanking in polling uh, just in the uh, past you know, week or so, uh, national polling. Uh, then you've got uh, Bernie Sanders. He's the blue line. He's been up or down, but he's been trending up uh, to, to kind of coincide with Biden's decline. And then that, uh, that, that orange line starts way down at the bottom, and then it just kind of spikes up over the last couple of weeks. That's Michael Bloomberg, who has spent uh, now about $400 million in his presidential campaign since beginning uh, his bid for president in late November. So if you think about that for a second, I think it was November 25th or 26th when he actually said, all right, I'm getting in. So you've got November to December, December to January. We're not even three months in, and Bloomberg has spent over $400 million, burning through more than $100 million a month, which admittedly is like pocket change to the billionaire, right? I mean, I don't care about how much money it's costing, but it is staggering, uh, given the fact I think uh, Donald Trump spent $400 million in, the, uh, in his entire presidential campaign back in 2016. Uh, and I suspect that when Bloomberg's on the debate stage tomorrow night, he's going to get hit uh, by his Democratic uh, colleagues for uh, trying to buy the election. 
uh, as well as his support for things like stop and frisk. Uh, and, and, you know, what's sad is that they're going to hammer Bloomberg for his stop and frisk policies in New York, but they're not going to hammer Bloomberg for the gun control laws that were enforced using stop and frisk. See, that's the problem. These are two sides of the same coin here. Uh, and, you know, I, I've had a lot of folks tell me, well, listen, there's nothing wrong with stop and frisk. I think if you go and you look at what happened in New York City with the stop and frisk policy, um, it was greatly abused at the very least. I mean, we're talking about four out of five black residents or young black men in New York City being stopped and frisked every year. And according to the ACLU, less than 1% of the time did those stop and frisks actually lead to a weapon being discovered. So I'll be honest with you, I mean, I'm not a fan of Michael Bloomberg, uh, but I'm also not a fan of how that policy was implemented in New York City. And certainly I'm not a fan of the gun laws that were enforced using this policy. But on that debate stage on Wednesday night, all of these candidates are going to say, well, listen, we love what you've done with gun control, Michael. That's not our problem. We, we, we love the gun control laws that you've put on the books in New York City, uh, raising it from a misdemeanor to a felony to possess a farm without a license. We love those laws. We just hate how you enforced them. Uh, that's basically going to be their argument. I think it's a crummy argument. I don't know about you, but let's talk about the actual laws that I believe had uh, as big a, a disproportionate impact on uh, young minority men in New York City as Stop and Frisk did. And to this day, these policies in New York State are still being used disproportionately, A, in New York City. Uh, we've covered this at Bearing Arms before. The SAFE Act, uh, the gun control package that was passed in New York State in 2013, signed by Governor Cuomo, most of those arrests are taking place in New York City, not upstate New York. In fact, most of those arrests are taking place in two of the five boroughs of New York City, the Bronx and Brooklyn. And most of those arrests under the SAFE Act are for one specific part of the SAFE Act, the felony possession of a firearm without a license. Now, that was a misdemeanor in New York State up until the passage of the SAFE Act. It was a felony in New York City before then because Bloomberg got the law changed. But with the passage of the SAFE Act, New York state law was then changed to comport with New York City law. And those tougher penalties for possessing a farm without a license now apply statewide, even though, again, most of the time they're only being used in New York City. Uh, the other day I had the opportunity, I've talked about this uh, a piece by Emily Basil on a slate a number of times at Bearing Arms. Uh, she did a piece where she covered the Brooklyn gun court. Uh, she actually wrote an entire book about it. She also did a podcast. And I actually had the chance to sit down and listen to this podcast uh, over the course of, I guess it was like three hours or so, uh, the other day. And it was, it was fascinating. It really was. Uh, you know, a lot of the uh, individuals that Emily uh, covered and, and, and even spoke with uh, were people who did not have serious criminal histories. They may have been, they may have been going down that wrong road. In some cases, they may not have been hanging out with the best folks. They may have been getting themselves in some minor trouble, but these were not hardened criminals. And the only crime that they were charged with was possession of a farm without a license. And they were facing, and many of them did, years in prison as a result of that. Something that is not even a crime in many states across the United States. Something that is a misdemeanor in many others, or even a civil penalty in some states. But it's a three and a half year felony sentence there in New York State. And that's that's all because of Michael Bloomberg. So I want to hear and again, we're not going to we're not going to hear this uh, on the Democratic debate stage, unfortunately. But I want to hear some questions about uh, directed to Bloomberg about not just stop and frisk, but about the laws that were enforced using stop and frisk. And if it doesn't happen, during the Democratic debate, if Bloomberg does get the nomination, I guarantee you it will come up uh, during the general election. Speaking of Bloomberg, I do want to get to a, uh, a few emails. Robert writing in, he said, I thought you might get a chuckle out of this. Saturday afternoon, I got a text message from somebody claiming to be with the Bloomberg campaign asking for my support. 
Uh, this was my reply. Hell no, he said. I'm a conservative gun owner. Never contact me again. And tell little Mikey he is a twerp. Uh, well, good for you, Robert. I, you know, I've seen so many folks uh, online saying that they are uh, getting contacted via text from the Bloomberg campaign. I, that has not happened to me. I hope that it doesn't happen to me. If it does happen to me, I will probably uh, paraphrase what you said, Robert. I might be a little bit uh, more <laughs> short and sweet than you were, but uh, but good luck, and hopefully they don't contact you again. Uh, I have some other emails to get to as well. David writing in says, I, I want to say I've listened to you for years. want to get some ideas on how to keep my new home from becoming anti-Second Amendment. I just moved to Utah from California for a new job. Congratulations, David. David says, I've enjoyed the freedom of my new home. I fear that anti-gun advocates will do to Utah as they're doing to states all over the country, like California. Any ideas on how to keep Utah free uh, other than the normal of calling my reps and and voting, which I plan on doing? Uh, He says, thank you uh, and keep up the fight. My best to you and your family. I know what it's like to have a loved one with cancer. My father, mother, grandmother, grandfather are all cancer survivors. Uh, God bless you and your family. Well, David, thank you so much, sir, for your thoughts and your kind words and uh, as for keeping Utah Second Amendment friendly, you know, it, it, it sounds trite, but a lot of it is staying involved. It is voting. But I would say the other component to that is outreach, right? You got to get those folks who are not gun owners, don't know much about firearms. And it's not that you have to turn them into gun owners. You don't have to turn them into NRA members. You don't have to turn them into huge Second Amendment supporters, You just have to give them the information that they need to understand that gun control is not the way to go. Uh, And I believe that in order to do that, and I think this is one of the things that uh, as gun owners, we, we sometimes are not so great at this, at our outreach efforts, because... We tend to approach non-gun owners or or people who disagree with us and and who support gun control, and we tend to use the arguments on them that that would work on us, as opposed to trying to put ourselves in their shoes. You know, this is a persuasion effort, ultimately. When we're talking about engaging in that outreach, we have to come to the people that we're trying to persuade from their perspective— and not from our perspective. It's not about, well, you don't get the Constitution, you don't get the Bill of Rights. Are you a moron? Are you stupid? Are you anti-American? Okay, you're not going to persuade anybody that way, right? So the first thing that I would do, David, in having these types of conversations is, is simply ask. I mean, if somebody comes up to you and, uh, David, why? Why do you own a gun? You can answer. But the first thing that I would do is I would ask, why do you have a problem with that? And find out what they have to say. Don't interrupt. Listen. Uh, You know, we talk so much about talking. But there is, I think, incredible value in listening to the other side. I I, I can have a conversation with somebody that I disagree with. And it can be a real conversation because I'll listen to what they have to say. I'll take that in. I'll think about it. And then I'll respond. And I think when you're talking about changing those hearts and minds when it comes to our right to keep and bear arms, that's something that we absolutely have to do. We have to listen to folks and find out why they feel the way they feel. And then we can talk with them in a way that hopefully will resonate with them. Uh, You know, I was having a conversation not long ago with somebody about red flag laws and their support for red flag laws was really based on their belief that that this would be helpful at preventing suicide. This is somebody that lost a loved one to suicide. It was not a farm-related suicide, but it was it was a suicide. And their goal is to stop people from feeling that same pain of losing a loved one uh, in that way. That's a genuine, heartfelt belief. And I'm not going to drag somebody for that. But my response was, you know what, I don't want to see suicide either. In fact, in Virginia, our suicide rates are climbing. Firearms are about half of all suicides in the state. Uh, And not only are are farm-related suicides increasing, but non-farm-related suicides are increasing. And when you look at red flag laws, and you look at the states where they've been on the books the longest, places like Indiana and Connecticut, the research shows that that gun-related suicides actually did decline 
in those two states once the red flag laws were put on the books. But the overall suicide rate increased even more. And so I don't believe that we should be trying to get people to kill themselves through another method. I believe that we should be trying to stop these individuals from taking their life in the first place. So that's one example of how, again, you can try to, to listen to, to what folks have to say and then, uh, you know, maybe approach this from a, uh, from, from, from a slightly different angle. Uh, anyway, best of luck to you, David. Uh, stay involved, stay engaged, and, uh, you know, take those opportunities to, uh, to, to, to make those uh, outreach efforts whenever possible. All right, let's get to today's uh, Armed Citizen story, our good deed of the day, our recidivist report. We will start there. You know, talk about New York State. Uh, how about this? CBS 6 in New York reporting that New York State has lost track of over 3,000 parolees, including some violent sex offenders. Yes, even while Governor Cuomo is uh, so focused on you and other legal law-abiding gun owners in the state of New York, uh, you know, the, the folks that they're supposed to be keeping track of, uh, they can't. Nearly 10% of the uh, individuals who are under supervision in New York State uh, have now uh, become what, what they're called parole absconders. They're just, you know, they've, they've, they've quit uh, uh, contacting their parole officers, and the state basically has no idea where they are. Uh, Karen Ziegler is the director of the Albany County Crime Victim and Sexual Violence Center. She said, I don't think anybody in the community is aware of that number. Well, they are now, thanks to uh, CBS 6 in Albany, uh, they said that they were alerted to one absconder who was on parole for manslaughter in New York City when the state lost track of him. Found later in Albany, rearrested in connection with the shooting of a 16-year-old. Uh, New York State Department of Corrections and Community Supervision says it arrested an average of 175 parole absconders every month in 2019. But the total number is still higher than it was eight months ago, with thousands of parolees still unaccounted for. Uh, the acting commissioner, Anthony Anucci. Uh, was approached by CBS 6 at a public meeting, but uh, CBS 6 says, quote, his team of security tried to stop us from getting anywhere near him. Uh, when they did finally get to the commissioner, they say he would not get off his phone to acknowledge the questions from the press. Uh, they say, quote, his staff directed us to call his public relations director, who a week before had declined our request for an interview. The agency did answer some of our questions by email. Uh, they say, for example, when a parolee cuts off a GPS device, quote, if there is a known threat to a victim, then attempts would be made to notify them. But only if there's a known threat to the victim. Otherwise, meh, you're probably just on your own. Karen Ziegler uh, says, um, I don't think the victims are being told. I don't think they're being warned. I don't think that they're aware that their safety is being compromised. Hmm. Wayne Spence, a, a parole officer, president of the New York State Public Employees Federation, uh, representing 900 parole officers across the state, uh, said that uh, the public is, quote, absolutely at risk uh, when these uh, parole absconders take off. He says that uh, a loss of parole officers has led to an increase in absconders. Uh, the state has moved to eliminate 400 positions through attrition. And he said because of reductions, officers are overwhelmed with their caseloads. Uh, going back to that uh, a piece that I mentioned before from Emily Bazelon, this is something that uh, she acknowledges as well, that a lot of these parole officers may have as many as 100 individuals that they're trying to keep track of, which is far beyond uh, not only the national average, but far beyond what, what uh, the, the recommendations are. Uh, you know, that uh, it's simply impossible for the average parole officer to keep track of all of the people that they're supposed to be monitoring. But rather than the state actually addressing that, Governor Cuomo has decided to uh, focus on you and me and uh, other legal gun owners in the state and around the country. Speaking of uh, legal gun owners in the state and around the country, let's uh, turn now to our armed citizen story. Vancouver, Washington, where a homeowner fatally shot a, a suspected burglar. This from uh, the Colombian newspaper uh, reporting on an incident that happened uh, late Thursday night. Vancouver police responded to a burglary in progress. Um, there was also a report of a disturbance with a firearm. An initial police bulletin said that uh, the homeowner told responding officers that an unknown person had broken into his home. He ended up confronting the stranger with his legally owned firearm and then shot that intruder. Uh, the suspect reportedly charged at the homeowner. 
who then fired his weapon. The suspect uh, fled out the door, collapsed behind the residence, according to local police. They say that they're continuing the investigation, but uh, right now it indicates that the male suspect forced open a rear door of the residence by kicking it in and was inside that home uh, when the homeowner confronted him. The alleged intruder pronounced dead at the scene. Uh, no further details have uh, been released. The homeowner and his family were not injured, thankfully. We'll keep our eyes on this story and bring any more details as they become available. Uh, finally tonight, our, or today, or this morning, whatever you might be uh, catching the program. Uh, finally, we've got our good deed of the day from Chattanooga, Tennessee, where a Chattanooga police officer uh, stepped up in a big way to help out a family who were victims of a scam. Kelly Phillips reached out to the uh, Chattanooga Police Department uh, after her son ended up selling a gaming system on the app Let Go, but the money that he received was counterfeit. Uh, Kelly says that uh, she had fallen on some hard times. Her son was simply trying to earn some money so that uh, he could buy Christmas presents for his younger siblings. And she uh, reached out to the Chattanooga Police Department to let him know what had happened. She, she got in contact with uh, Officer Kevin Osborne. And Officer Osborne was touched by uh, her story. He and other officers pitched in to buy her son a new PlayStation uh, after uh, that, that uh, PlayStation that he had sold. Uh, you know, he got that uh, fake cash. A, a good deed was shared on Facebook. Strangers saw it, eventually befriended Kelly uh, and uh, helped her buy a, a car that could get her around. She said, we've never had anything like that. Nothing reliable or even with heat or air conditioning for that matter. That's the first thing my son said. Does it have a heater? Uh, and uh, uh, Kelly was um, able to take part in a, uh, a recent event there with News Channel 9 where uh, basically the, 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 the TV station uh, threw a dinner party for uh, Officer Osborne uh, with the help of Kelly Phillips and uh, those uh, community members who were so touched by this. Um, she actually... Uh, uh, was able to give $500 uh, through the McMahon Law Firm and uh, News Channel 9 uh, to Officer Osborne. She said, I, I want to thank you, show my gratitude to you, God working through you to change my life. She said, uh, that day he really worked through you, Kevin, and it changed everything for me. Without your kindness, I don't know where I would be today. Officer Osborne says, you know, a lot of people think the police are bad. He said, just trying to help, uh, just trying to help her out, show her that people do care doesn't matter where you came from. So in the right place, at the right time, willing and able to do the right thing, uh, Officer Osborne there in uh, Chattanooga, Tennessee, Kevin Osborne, we thank you, sir, for your good deed. That is going to do it for this edition of Bearing Arms Cam and Company. Thank you for being a part of the program today. Uh, hopefully we'll be able to connect with Sheriff Scott Jenkins on tomorrow's program, get you caught up on the latest doings in the state of Virginia in the aftermath of the defeat of House Bill 961. Don't forget you can subscribe to Town Hall Media at YouTube. Never miss a program. Also, uh, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, townhall.com's podcast page. You can become a VIP member of Bearing Arms at bearingarms.com as well. Get exclusive analysis, commentary, and more, and help to support the Second Amendment journalism that we do each and every day. Thank you again for tuning in the program. Have a great rest of your 2A Tuesday. We'll see you back here tomorrow with another edition of Bearing Arms, Cam and Company.